There can be little doubt that calcium impacts the results of PCI. It can impair device delivery and crossing, and it can result in delamination of polymer, whether it's bioresorbable or permanent. This can alter the drug delivery, may lead to corrosion and even fracture. Most of all, it's been associated with stent underexpansion, which is a powerful predictor of restenosis and stent thrombosis. Current technologies are limited with respect to their ability to treat calcium. Balloons have insufficient force even at 20 to 30 atmospheres. They are complicated by barotrauma and rupture. Atheroablative technologies are limited by wire bias in an incredibly eccentric rut or trough created by atherectomy, or unpredictable complications such as perforations caused by laser. Intravascular lithotripsy applies the technology that has been used for over 30 years to treat kidney stones. Acoustic pressure waves are generated from emitters placed on the shaft of the balloon angioplasty catheter at one pulse per second, each lasting a microsecond and transmitting up to 50 atmospheres of instantaneous pressure to the intimal, superficial and deep medial calcium. The balloon is inflated to four atmospheres, 10 impulses are given, and the balloon is then inflated to a nominal pressure of six atmospheres. If full balloon inflation does not occur, the balloon is deflated, reperfusion occurs, and then the cycle is repeated. Eventually, full balloon inflation will be achieved at a six atmosphere pressure. The mechanism of action appears to be multiplane longitudinal calcium fracture. As you can see on the far right, there is calcium fracture expansion with stent deployment, which appears to be the mechanism for increased transmural compliance. The CAD3 study design is a prospective multi-center single arm global IDE study performed in four countries, the US, UK, Germany and France. Patients with heavily calcified de novo coronary lesions were enrolled. This definition includes radio opacities on both sides of the vessel, extending at least 50 millimeters in length by angiography, or a calcium angle at least 270 degrees by intravascular imaging. Reference vessel diameters had to be 2.5 to 4 millimeters, and stenosis severity had to be at least 50%, and lesion length had to be 40 millimeters or less. One role in patient per site was allowed at 47 global sites. There were 47 role in and 384 patients in the intention to treat population. The primary endpoint was assessed at 30 days and there was a 100 patient OCT substudy. The primary safety endpoint was freedom from MACE at 30 days and MACE was defined as cardiac death, myocardial infarction, or target vessel revascularization. The primary effectiveness endpoint was procedural success, defined as successful stent delivery with residual stenosis of less than 50% without in-hospital MACE. Key secondary endpoints are shown and include procedural success with a residual stenosis less than or equal to 30%, and no in-hospital MACE to allow a sensitivity analysis with a more contemporary definition. These are the key clinical and angiographic eligibility criteria. They include being biomarker negative, having an injection fraction greater than 25%, single de novo lesions with a stenosis greater than 70% but less than 100% were included. If the stenosis was at least 50% but less than 70%, there had to be objective evidence of myocardial ischemia or an FFR measurement of less than or equal to 0.8 or a lumen area of less than or equal to 4 millimeters squared by intravascular imaging. The exclusion criteria included renal failure, defined as creatinine greater than 2.5 or dialysis, and myocardial infarction within 30 days. The pre-specified performance goals for this study were based on the rates from the predicate single-arm non-randomized Orbit 2 IDE study for orbital atherectomy, which enrolled similar patient population with similar endpoints and definitions. The relative risk of 1.5 was utilized per FDA guidance. 
the primary safety performance goal was calculated as 100% minus 1.5 times the observed 30-day MACE rate of 10.4%. And the primary effectiveness performance goal was calculated at 100% minus 1.5 times the observed procedural failure rate in orbit 2 of 11.1%. This study is over 80% powered for both co-primary performance goals at a one-sided type 1 error rate of 5%. I want to acknowledge and thank the CAD3 study support infrastructure, including my co-PI, Dean Kariakis, the study chairman, Greg Stone, the clinical events committee was chaired by Steve Marks, the DSMB was chaired by Etisham Mahmoud, and the angiographic core lab directed by Maria Alfonso, and the OCT Core Lab, directed by Akiko Mahara. They all did an incredible job. Most of all, I want to acknowledge and thank the top enrolling centers and the site principal investigators as shown here. This group did a remarkable job to bring this trial to completion in the face of COVID-19. Patients were enrolled from January 2019 to March 2020. A total of 431, which included 47 roll-in and 384 in the intention to treat population. The completeness of follow-up is shown. There was only one patient loss to follow-up and two deaths. These are the baseline clinical characteristics. The average age was 71. 90% of patients had either hypertension or hyperlipidemia. 40% had diabetes and 26% were defined as renal insufficiency using an EGFR of less than 60. As you can see on the right, 70% of patients had class two or three angina. These were the baseline angiographic characteristics, including a baseline reference vessel diameter average of three millimeters, lesion length average of 26 millimeters, and a calcified segment length of 48 millimeters. 100% of these target lesions were classified as severe calcification. These were the procedural characteristics which show that 50% of the targets were predilated with a two millimeter or less balloon. An average of 69 IVL pulses were administered per case with a maximum IVL balloon inflation pressure of six atmospheres. Over 99% of stents were successfully delivered. These are the angiographic outcomes on the left. You can see the stepwise reduction in severity stenosis from pre-procedure to post-IVL and final instent. And on the right, the stepwise increase in minimum lumen diameter at the same time intervals. A diameter stenosis of less than 30% was achieved in 99.5% of patients. These are the angiographic complications noted as post-IVL and final. As you can see, severe dissection type D through F was observed in 2.1% post-IVL. This was reduced to 0.3% following stent deployment at the end of the procedure. Note that perforation, abrupt closure, and no reflow were zero post-IVL. These figures at the end of the procedure were 0.3%, 0.3%, and remained zero for no reflow. The primary safety endpoint, freedom from 30-day MACE, was observed in 92.2%. The lower confidence boundary of 89.9% meets the safety performance goal. The primary effectiveness endpoint, stent delivery, with residual stenosis less than 50% and no in-hospital MACE, was observed in 92.4%. Again, the lower confidence boundary of 90.2% meets the effectiveness performance goal. This slide shows the in-hospital and 30-day MACE of 7 and 7.8% respectively, along with the individual components. Key secondary endpoints included device crossing success, angiographic success with a less than 50% residual stenosis, angiographic success with a less than or equal to 30% residual stenosis. All of these were 96% or greater. Procedural success with residual stenosis less than or equal to 30% was 92.2%. On the left, 
is a diagnosis of periprocedural MI using three definitions per protocol, fourth universal, and sky. None of these definitions altered the primary conclusions of this trial. And on the right, you can see the target lesion failure was 7.6%, all revascularization was 2.6% and stent thrombosis 0.8%. IVL ventricular capture has been noted before this study and in this study demonstrates that 41% of patients had some evidence of IVL induced capture. It was significantly more common if the pre-procedure heart rate was lower, particularly by multivariate analysis less than 60 beats per minute. The drop in systolic blood pressure was more frequent, but as you can see, not more severe based on this analysis. And there were no significant sequelae. With the introduction of any new technology, there's a learning curve. This slide compares the 47 roll-ins, which was the first case for each of the 47 international sites compared to the 384 patients in the pivotal study. These two groups were similar with respect to clinical and angiographic characteristics. And as you can see, their key outcomes, 30-day freedom from MACE, procedural success, even device crossing success were similar. In conclusion, I'd say that the success of the DISRUPT CAD3 trial was achieved as both the primary safety and effectiveness endpoints were met following treatment with coronary IVL in severely calcified lesions. Coronary IVL prior to drug eluting stent implantation was well tolerated with low rates of major periprocedural clinical and angiographic complications. Transient IVL induced ventricular capture was common but was benign with no clinical sequelae in any patient. And although this study represents the initial coronary IVL experience for US operators, high procedural success and low angiographic complications were achieved reflecting the relative ease of use of IVL technology. Thank you for your attention.